so welcome back, everyone. I'm really looking forward to this next panel. It's called Solutions to the Transmission Impasse and Untangling the Wires. There's a lot of wires to potentially untangle over the next 20 years, and I'm really pleased to introduce Rob Gramlich. He is the president, founder and president of Grid Strategies, LLC, and he's going to help us untangle some of those wires. Um, joining him is Scott Bolton. He's the Senior Vice President of Transmission and Market Development at Pacific Core. And then we have Maury Galbraith, uh, Executive Director of Western Interstate Energy Board. Welcome, Maury. And then our very own Neil Miller, Vice President of Infrastructure and Ops Planning. So a really dynamic panel um, to talk about transmission. And I'm going to steal a quote from a colleague who said that if you like generation, and I think everybody in this room likes generation, you have to love transmission. So I think you're going to love this panel. So Rob, it's all yours. Thanks, Joanne. Well, clearly, uh, keeping people awake after lunch through a transmission panel is um, you know, <laughs> definitely the right, the right strategy there. Um, thanks, for, thanks for coming. Thanks to the Kaiso folks and uh, Elliot for inviting me to be here. Um, uh, Elliot and I got to know each other pretty well about 15 years ago when I was working in the wind industry, uh, leading the, um, the wind association in DC's uh, transmission work. And he, he called from Bonneville and said, all your damn wind projects, well, he was much nicer about it, are in the same spot. And when the wind blows, they all go at the same time. And when the wind stops, they all stop. Can we spread this around? Can't we get greater regional diversification so that we can actually you know, have an overall steady supply? And uh, a couple years later, then we worked together on the open season to get new transmission to enable more of that. And um, you know, it, it, that, that was all. Uh, working pretty well. Well, you know, fast forward 15 years, here we are again talking on a more macro scale uh, uh, about regional diversification. So I wanted to just tee the, our great panelists off here first on that sort of general, you know, why are we talking about transmission with this involving resource mix? Why is, uh, why is transmission what everybody seems to be talking about? Scott, you want to get us started? Yeah, sure. Uh, thanks. And it's a real pleasure to be here, be here in person and amongst transmission policy giants. Um, yeah, so I mean, we're almost at the point in, I don't know if over my career I've seen such a consensus build over the need for more transmission, particularly in the West. You know, there are not a lot of voices out there saying we don't need more transmission. Uh, and whether that's at the federal level, state level, even among our customers, we're being asked a lot more about transmission. It's almost at the point where you know, it's kind of pick your best argument. Um, you know, we need more transmission capacity to meet growing electricity loads. We're seeing a lot of load growth out there. And that's really before I think the full effects of uh, load build building policies kick into place when you look at vehicle electrification, um, building electrification. You know, the, the investment, uh, the Inflation Reduction Act, the IRA that just passed, uh, has a lot of provisions in it, but it's really one of the first big pieces of federal public policy that envisions load building in the electric sector. So preparing for that is one kind of flavor of, of rationale for more transmission. Um, but we also need more diverse transmission paths for reliability and resilience. You know, this morning's panels talked about weathering through extreme weather events. Uh, transmission is a big part of that solution of keeping the lights on and creating those, you know, reliability, you know, grid hardening opportunities that we know we see uh, because we're kind of just stretching through these events now. And also, you know, just the diversity of new technologies and resources we're seeing. You've got to have more transmission to get to new areas to exploit. Uh, renewable resource opportunities. The connect, interconnection queue requests that we see are enormous. There's a lot of appetite out there to invest in new generation. All of that requires new transmission to interconnect and integrate. And then again, as we see markets emerge, um, transmission is absolutely going to be key to fully, uh, fully extracting the value of 
both the real time and the proposed day ahead market. Having more transmission paths, more just flex in that system, using better what we already have, but having more diversity in the grid is absolutely going to unlock the benefits of all this new generation coming on and meeting those new loads. So, I mean, the case is strong. It really is pick your favorite argument. Great. Thanks, Scott. And uh, more, you wake up every day thinking about the whole West, and it, which is a pretty unique uh, role uh, that you have there. What are your thoughts on the evolving resource mix and the need for transmission? Well, let me start with the revolving resource mix and, and where we're headed and, and how you build uh, resource diversity sort of over time. So if you look at the California ISO's 20-year outlook, right, and look at the generation that's going to be built over the next 20 years, they call it their starting point portfolio. If you look at what's included in there, it's an awful lot of utility solar, uh, battery storage, and wind. Those three technologies comprise, I think, 95% of the future build out over the next 20 years, according to that, that outlook, right? And, and that's significant. Um, the Western Interstate Energy Board recently looked at utility integrated resource plans from across the West, and we sort of compiled the preferred resource portfolios from those plans. And shocker, uh, all those utilities are building utility solar, Battery storage and wind, and and you know in in our compilation the California ISO was roughly 65 percent of the total, right? So again, there's going to just be a tremendous amount of those three technologies built over the next 20 years, and I think what you're going to have is you're going to have an awful lot of utilities that um, have uh, decreases in net load during the the daylight hours, and they probably have some pretty steep ramps in the early evening hours, especially in the summer. So they're all going to be similar in that regard, right? Uh, so, so you don't see a lot of diversity there, right? It's not the, it's not the incremental additions to the, the generation mix that creates diversity. It's the, the accumulation of generating resources over time. So, you know, in the West, uh, you know, decades ago, we, you know, prior to the 1970s, uh, everybody was building hydro, right? Lots of hydro. And then after the hydro wave was done, we moved into nuclear and coal. Uh, after the Western electricity crisis of 2000, 2001, there was a big build out of the natural gas generating fleet. Uh, in the mid 2000s, we saw with, you know, with some of the renewable portfolio standards coming on board, we saw an awful lot of wind. And again, over the next few years, we, solar has been the, the resource of choice for a while now, but it's going to ramp up. I think uh, battery storage is probably uh, the next wave and all of that. But, uh, you know, so it's that accumulated generating fleet that has an awful lot of diversity to it. It's diverse not only in its technologies, but it's diverse geographically. You've got a lot of hydro in the northwest, a lot of solar in the southwest, right? That resource diversity is extremely valuable to the Western interconnection. And so now pivoting and, and, and making the connection to transmission. Uh, transmission is the technology that allows us to leverage that geographic diversity, right? Transmission is what allows generation and electrons to flow from low price areas to high price areas. It allows us to spread out the surpluses. It allows us to fill in the deficits, right? And so, you know, historically, transmission has been built to, you know, interconnect generation first. That was the first consideration. Sort of the second consideration was, well, do, we've got, do we have any thermal overloads on the system? Are we going to melt any equipment? Um, and, and I think that market transmission, transmission to leverage that diversity and move electrons and, and spread them out and, and lower power costs for everybody, that was sort of a, 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 an, you know, a postscript or an afterthought to the whole transmission planning exercise. I think going forward, that, that need, what I would call market transmission, I think that's going to become sort of a legitimate need. I think, I think the folks at the California ISO are already incorporating that need in their planning. I think if you look a lot at, at you know, in their plan, they've got upgrades to the ISO system. I think a lot of that is to facilitate you know, market transactions. But I don't think it's yet taken over in the rest of the West. And so you know, that, that need for market transmission, I think, is going gonna, is gonna to be something that, that changes in the future. So that's, that's where I would start. 
Thanks, Maury. I uh, appreciate that. Um, Neil, sure. uh, your, your thoughts? You lead uh, planning for CAISO. Sure. So. Yeah, so glad to jump in on you. So just building on some of the comments already made, you know, five years ago, we were actually dealing with forecasts for transmission planning that were flat or even negative load growth. But now we're looking at some of the steepest load growth forecasts we've seen in 15 years. A lot of that has started, the, you know, the emergence of electrification, not only transportation, but other industries. That's driving the requirement as well as the need to clean the grid in general. So when we're looking at the different, you know, how the resource planning has evolved, uh, two years ago we were doing 10-year plans looking at adding 1,000 megawatts a year to the grid. This year's plan is looking at 4,000, and the draft portfolios for next year are looking at about 7,000 megawatts of installed capacity a year. Now, the other thing different about California is with the more diverse resource fleet, and we desperately need that resource diversity to help manage, keep the costs, you know, rely, keep the system reliable, affordable, and green. The, uh, the other issue you have to deal with is those resources are often not in the same locations. So we're literally on a daily basis shifting our load, the generation that's supplying our load from one area to another and back again. And that's a daily occurrence. Clearly that means we have a requirement right up front that we need to move around a lot of power inside the state, as well as address these emerging needs outside. Now, Maury mentioned the 20 year outlook. That to us was really a first step where we were in this era of the resource planning constantly shifting. We really thought it was important to set out a, a unified vision of what that longer term resource plan would look like and the kind of transmission it would take to pull it off. So the 20 year out was, outlook was a product with the participation and the coordination with the Energy Commission, the Public Utilities Commission in the resource planning and then us developing the transmission that would make it work. And we saw that document being a really critical to help put the context in place of the kind of transmission build we would be looking at. And also when we're making decisions right now about projects we need in five, 10 years, that they're clearly part of an articulated long-term strategy as opposed to a one-off. So we think that's been a very helpful approach there. Now in the 20 year outlook, we also, you know, the costs were almost divided up a third, a third, a third. Almost a third focused on offshore wind, especially the great resource in the North Coast area, also in the Central Coast, but a lot of the dollars accessing Central. Uh, a third of the costs moving power around inside the state and accessing great resource basins there. And another third focused on accessing out of state wind resources in other parts of the West. And we thought it was important to get that picture out there because there are projects out that can help deliver some of that capacity almost through a pipeline type approach. It goes in at one end, comes out at California. But once we get past those, we are going to need broader network integration and the kind of coordinated projects that provide benefit not only to California, but to the rest of the West as well. And that will require a higher level of coordination than we have today. Great, thanks, Neil. Um, yeah, just to maybe put a bow on this kind of general topic of evolving resource mix and transmission. I, I know, I mean, it was a heroic effort that, uh, you know, CAISO and a lot of parties kept the lights on through September. and. Uh, you know, I think everybody was pretty uh, pretty pleased and impressed with that. And uh, certain resources like storage, moving power across time, uh, really proved themselves, and that was great. But this issue of moving power across space uh, is also really valuable. There's always a lot of imports. A lot of people don't, usually regular people don't pay attention to just the, the amount of power, extreme amount of power that moves back and forth across areas. And California probably is the biggest, you know, uh, importer of, of energy in the country. So, um, you know, just the, the importance of that, and I was just, uh, did a, looked up the, uh, the output from out-of-state renewables. You know, New Mexico, solar, and wind were very strong at the times when California was under their stressful conditions. Uh, Idaho, Wyoming wind was, uh, was very good. So this regional diversification, uh, enabled only by transmission sure would, would help. And that's just, I think that's a future that really all regions are looking at, but we need to build and plan for that. Uh, Neil, I think, well, first of all, I think we're gonna pull up a slide to, to follow up on what you were talking about for the California 20 year outlook. Um, and maybe you can just tell us a little bit what we're looking at. I mean, what yes. we're trying to get around the country, I think is more transmission planners to actually plan for the future, which seems like kind of what mm -hmm. planning should be, but it's all too often not happening in most regions. 
Uh, but this sure. was a, a rare and uh, a, a interesting example of actually planning out for that future resource mix. Yes, uh, thanks for that. So yes, this uh, is a simple diagram that really laid out the, the heart of the 20-year outlook, identifying the major resource centers and the, path, the critical paths that need to be upgraded to get in-state resources to the load centers to move the power around. We identified on over on the uh, coming out of the North Coast area, the key transmission alternatives we have to access transmission. And for the volumes that we're talking about in the North Coast, I want to be clear, for us it's right now, it's a case of really which of these come first. It's not one or the other, it's just more a case of which first. We see that coming out of the North Coast, the high likelihood of needing some overhaul, some long haul overland HVDC transmission some connection sooner or later to the 500 kV system, the existing, and a huge potential for submarine cable coming down the coast to reach right into the Greater Bay Area. Uh, within the state, you see the solar, wind resources, and a lot of storage potential. A lot of our key 500 kV paths will need to be reinforced to manage this amount of power. And uh, the part that really where this conversation focuses is on the relatively simplistically drawn lines showing resources coming in from New Mexico and from Wyoming in particular. Now, there are other choices up there, uh, but right now, you know, several of the projects that are moving forward on a merchant basis are really what I call the pipeline structure. What we were wanting to do with the outlook was really identify the kind of capacity transfers we needed and where we would eventually need those injection points into the California system but to start the conversation with our Western neighbors. This isn't to say we've got, you know, this is the final plan, we will build exactly X capacity from this point to this point. This was identifying the total capacity requirements. There are some projects out there that actually follow some of those lines, but then beyond that, we need to get into a better network conversation so that we can make the best use and provide the best diversity advantage as we move forward. So we think this helps inform the conversation. It's not the end of the conversation. Now, I'm just kidding. For inside the state, this is what we're building. <laughs> it's just the case of when. But no, the, uh, inside the state, those paths are already, many of those paths are already showing up in this year's transmission plan and will definitely be showing up in next year's plan tied around adding 70 gigawatts over the next decade. So th these, these charts need to be taken seriously, even though they're, they're fairly simplistic. Yeah, the future is coming fast. Uh, it's a lot of investment. Um, Maureen, Scott, you know, thoughts on, on this or other sort of near-term transmission initiatives out there, Maury? Well, I'd make two observations about the chart that's up on the screen. I think the first one is about the speed and scale of the investment. Neil has already talked about that. You know, in the 20-year in the outlook, uh, the California ISO uh, sort of talks about this and says that the industry is at a point of inflection, and I couldn't agree more. Um, you know, moving from 1,000 megawatts of new generating capacity built every year for 10 years to 4,000 megawatts built every year to 10 years uh, is, a, is a big leap. But I think if you add up, you know, I was doing the math earlier. If you add up what's in the starting point portfolio, there's 120 gigawatts of generation over the next 20 years. That's more like 6,000 megawatts of installed capacity per year for the next 20 years, right? We've never seen anything like that in terms of continuous ongoing investment. And I think that's really going, and, and we are at a point of inflection. And I don't think that that's fully understood uh, throughout the industry. I couldn't agree more. And when I say the industry, I mean, I don't think it's understood necessarily by the, uh, the, the utility CEOs, uh, the utility regulators, and certainly not by the utility customers. And so we have a lot of work to do to sort of set expectations and prepare people for that. Those are some pretty big and ongoing uh, potential rate increases that need to be dealt with and communicated. So so that's one thing I would point out about all the generation investment that you see there embedded in that chart. The, the other thing I'd point out is, is I don't think it does justice to how much California is relying on the rest of the West. It shows about 10,000 megawatts of wind from New Mexico and Idaho and Wyoming coming in. That's the, the wind that requires new transmission to come into California. But one of the really interesting 
bits of analysis in the Outlook is, is that if you look at the, the generation dispatch out in 2040 for what they call the uh, net peak or the high system need scenario, this is the scenario that focuses on those early evening hours in the summer. If you look at the generation dispatch, the load that is serving California in that scenario, there's over 11,000 megawatts of imports from outside of California in that scenario. So it's not, just the, it's not just the wind that you see there. There's an awful lot of imports coming in in those early evening hours as well. And that's probably you know, clean, dispatchable hydro generation from other parts of the West. And you know, there's going to be competition for that, for that resource. There's, there's other utilities in the West that are going to want to use it for, for similar needs. And, um, and we probably need to figure out how we're going to build, again, market transmission outside of California to facilitate those kinds of market transactions. So that's, that's my reaction to the Great. Thanks, that. Maury. Uh, Scott, rumor has it you guys have some transmission <laughs> lines. Yeah. It, well, and I also want to give Maury credit because I think it's a term being coined here, market transmission. So we'll, we'll see if it like hashtags and trends. But yeah, yeah. Um, it is an important component of how we're looking at planning across the West. And yeah, if, if you look at that map, um, there's a lot There's a lot going on in the white sections of, of, of the map um, around the rest of the region. You know, as Stefan Bird mentioned this morning, you know, we're proud to have uh, initiated our Gateway South project this, this past spring. We're now turning dirt in three states. So we're building from central Wyoming, kind of clipping the, the northwest end of Colorado and terminating that line 416 miles in south central Utah. And you know, I think it's important to note that even with all the transmission development happening and frankly need for more transmission development to be happening, the West is doing so under very different paradigms. Uh, how the CAISO plans for its transmission needs and executes on those plans looks a lot different in, say, the Pacific Corp system, where our primary mission is to serve the loads of our customers within that, that system. And you know, we're, we're blessed. Uh, Pacific Corp, you know, by its very nature, is an interregional footprint. When we build transmission, uh, we're building transmission across long hauls and across several jurisdictions. And so, you know, almost by happy accident, I think we are uh, a positive contributor to building out that regional, you know, network uh, that is going to bring more resource diversity and is going to bring more time and, you know, pathway certainty uh, to different load, load serving entities. But, you know, we have to make that case that, you know, first and foremost, that transmission is going to be benefiting those retail customers that we serve as well. Um, and so as, you know, Maury hits on, which frankly, you know, is an underpinning theme of this whole symposium, the emergence of markets needs to become a much more robust part of that analysis and that planning to be able to, deter, to, to show we aren't just interconnecting the resources that we need to serve our loads, but that this additional transmission uh, capability being built uh, by us, by others outside of California, contributes to a more robust platform for trading, for, for being able to transact in energy in ways that will lower those net power costs and be able to deliver those same savings to those retail customers, just by different means than what we've traditionally demonstrated. Great, thanks, Scott. Uh, I'm going to press you each on costs a little bit. This stuff is not cheap. We have some consumer advocate clients at my firm, and and uh, you know most of the consumer advocates around the country, I would say, are generally recognizing that we need a significant transmission build out. They're also realizing that oh crap, we have 70 year old lines that have to be replaced, so we have this double whammy on cost. Uh, and there's a lot of debate at FERC and in the RTOs about, you know, whether all the local upgrades are needed or, you know, do they, are, they do, are they spending the right money on the right types of investments? 
so it's tough. I mean, it's tough for everybody. How do you, you know, how do you swallow this? And of course, transmission's really lumpy. So you might, the most efficient long-term investment might be, you know, much more than you need tomorrow, uh, but somebody's got to pay for that. So um, I'm going to start with you, Scott, yeah. this time. What do you, how do we get a handle on that? No, without a doubt, the, the, the capital requirements and just the cost pressures that can find their way to retail rates are significant. And, and we see that. We see that concern expressed from our regulators. Um, we do get the question in the, quite a bit, you know, are, the, you know, are we planning the right way? Are we planning enough? Are these the right projects? Um, you know, it's hard to reassure in that environment when folks are looking at you know, significant cost increases associated with very capital intensive investments. But we do have tools in the toolbox. I think the first piece is to simply reassure that, yes, we're making the right investments, that these are the right projects. And we can show that the market is really giving us that information. You know, we're, we're almost in a constant state of system planning and studies. And you know, we're not just making these things up. We're getting feedback from developers. We're getting feedback from uh, large load customers on what their needs and expectations are. And so it really does give us the ability to dial in, in addition to regional planning, in addition to our integrated resource planning, that these transmission lines will ultimately be in the public benefit. When it comes to how do you, how do you manage those costs, you know, we have a couple tools in the toolbox. Uh, certainly, as you heard this morning from Secretary Granholm, and as folks are well aware, you know, there, there's a lot of focus right now at the federal level in trying to incentivize, trying to take some of the costs, some of the inflationary pressures out of energy. A big piece of that is infrastructure. So anywhere where we can either pair lower cost resources because of tax credits and subsidies, with new transmission, you can lower that overall cost, or even better, where you can remove some of those costs around permitting and siting, or even the infrastructure itself. That will have a deflationary effect in the immediate term over these long amortized investments. The other, again, is markets. And it's being able to not just show the benefits that we have already through the EIM, but to be able to go beyond that uh, be able to, to, to better optimize the system and lower those production costs, lower those net power costs that customers experience. So maybe your rate base goes up. Maybe you, know, you have one part of the cost equation going up because of the amount of investment over a compressed period of time, but you're able to lower that energy cost component as well and offset some of that. That's the challenge before us. That's how I think we have to try and tackle it. Maury, a favorite cost management option in your view? Well, I think people are always going to have questions unless you analyze it sort of holistically. And I think the biggest challenge to convincing people that you've identified the right lines or the right transmission investment is that we do transmission planning in the West on a sub-regional sort of, I don't want to be too pejorative, but sort of piecemeal kind of approach, right? The, the identified lines for the out-of-state wind that is included in the, the outlook, you know, the Sun Zia, Trans West, Swip North, cross tie lines, right? Those identified lines. How do you know that those are the most cost-effective lines for uh, meeting, you know, the needs, right? I don't think you know unless you analyze uh, the entire Western interconnection. I don't think you can just look at the generation that's being added in California and answer that question. I think you have to look at the Western interconnection Holistically, you have to look at all the generation that is being added because there's there's synergies there. There's 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 interplay between uh, where all the different utilities are adding generation, and so you're looking for that global cost minimizing solution as opposed to say a local cost minimizing solution. So I really think we have to figure out how to do sort of holistic interconnection wide uh, transmission planning. Um, 
I say planning and I sort of draw it out there. I, so I really applaud the California ISO for doing a 20 year outlook. I think it is, I, I, I spent the last week diving into it and pulling it apart. I think it's a really excellent document, right? But it is an outlook and they're pretty clear, don't call it a plan. It's not a project approval process. I think they have that repeated in there several times, right? But it is a thing, and what I would say is, and, and, and they, all, they also talk about this in the plan, is that they're doing this sort of outside their tariff. And you know, I would call that, you know, I'd create a new acronym, call it OTT. We need it, more of those. We need more outside the tariff work. We need to get outside the FERC tariff. Uh, Rob is sitting in the in the front row again. I'm sorry, Rob, but we need to escape the attachment K straitjacket that comes with that that FERC tariff, and 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 do more creative planning like this plan. And we need to bring along some of the other planning regions. Uh, the the Western Power Pool is doing some OTT work. I'm really excited about that. I think that's great. We need to sort of turn it up a little bit and do outside the tariff coordination across those three regions to try and get to, is this really the most cost effective solution for, for, the, for the West and for all the, all the participants? So that would, that would be my soap That's box, good. Soapbox uh, speech, how about that? Yeah, yeah. Uh, holistically and, and region wide. Uh, Neil, cost management. Okay, so a few things here. Uh, <laughs> Right off the top, optimization for us is really what gets coordinated through the state agency work. The resource planning responsibility of the state agencies, we work with the Energy Commission, Public Utilities Commission. We provide them information on alternatives and costs that goes into part of the resource planning. So then when we're looking at the transmission side, we're saying, okay, even with these higher level estimates of what it might cost, now it's our job to find the best solution that delivers that outcome. Is there a better, cheaper way than doing it than, than what the first ideas were, the ones that were used in the original optimization? So that's where we have a lot of room then to try to fine tune the solutions and make sure we're producing the best projects. I don't mind at times it's frustrating, like we have, we have three different ways of looking at transmission around projects we need for reliability, projects that are primarily driven to meet state policy goals, as well as our economic studies that are just looking for ways to pull down the total delivered cost. That latter category is often kind of controversial because we may move on a small pro on a project that reduces uh, local capacity requirement costs or energy costs. But the focus and the criticism is still on you raised your transmission access charge because those other costs are not part of our total bucket. So we do need to keep reinforcing that message that the goal is to reduce the overall cost and to keep that overall cost as low as possible. And some of these transmission costs are necessary to achieve that. You know, one of the things I just wanted to, to circle back, uh, Maury mentioned about our use of trans intertie transmission now for other purposes. Last year, the CPUC gave us some very helpful public declaration that when we're exploring these additional transmission requirements, that's meant to be above the existing transmission. We're not out, supposed to encroach on the current uses our existing transmission's already being put to. So that's an important distinction for me, that this is incremental, it gets us at the table. Now, do we have the right decision-making and uh, over holistic study process? Right now, I would say that's a work in progress. We still have to make do with the processes we do have and keep driving to the best solutions. But certainly, uh, more opportunity for uh, discussion. Uh, I'm gonna have to distance myself from Maury introducing any new acronyms. That's, that's, <laughs> that will kill the conversation right there, but sorry. But uh, setting that aside, uh, we do need to have better ways to uh, improve the coordination and the planning discussions. The FERC Interregional Transmission Planning Coordination, it wasn't a planning process, it was planning coordination, was established for sharing of information and to allow parties to use common information in assessing what these different projects would provide to them. Unfortunately, I think the cost allocation provisions in, uh, that were built into the FERC Order 1000 order, unfortunately became a bit of a poison pill for getting more meaningful discussion because at the end of the day, trying to find any structure that removes anyone's ability to feel like they have a voice in controlling their destiny and what major projects move forward is not going to work. So we actually saw more external parties stepping back from the deeper interregional planning discussions out of fear of something being 
railroaded through them on a uh, through the interregional cost allocation measure. So that was unfortunate. We do feel that cost us a bit of time. We're right now pursuing, trying to get engaged on a number of different paths, discussions with WEC, with, with Maury's group, and a number of other approaches, trying to find what the best way is to start getting consensus and having those, those more meaningful discussions. But at the end of the day, the people moving on those projects are going to have to feel that those projects are providing an appropriate value to them and to the ratepayers that they're representing in those conversations. So a centralized single decision-making entity is not going to be able to take that away. The coordination could be vastly improved, and I think that's where an RTO could provide value in the data sharing, the coordination, the joint study work. But uh, in terms of decision-making, any RTO structure is still going to have to deal with this. And being a Westerner myself, I think Westerners are always going to be more adamant about their right to participate in the decision-making than having it decided somewhere else. Okay, well, thanks, uh, Neil. So, I mean, you, you got, you're, you're being uh, gentle about the um, interregional progress over the last decade. There hasn't been much of really anything. Uh, and uh, I'm, not, I'm not sure anybody really, I'm not sure that's controversial. Yeah, inside the tariff didn't work, so let's try outside the tariff. Yeah, uh, whatever you call it. Yeah. I mean, do we, do we have the right institutions? We have three regional planning entities in the West. And there's, WAC is there to, you know, they can do studies, they have data, they have, um, you know, credibility and reliability authority. Uh, is, is it a question of who should do what, or should everybody kind of get in this game and start looking at uh, looking at options? You know, what paths are most valuable? What paths would create the you know improve reliability, and then bring that to policymakers? Uh, it seems a little bit ad hoc to me, but what, what do you what do you think? So, as Neil, I'll, I'll start with that. I think the current interregional process isn't working. Uh, you were being kind saying it hasn't been working well. I'm not aware of any interregional projects or actually regional projects outside of the ISO footprint that have moved forward since for quarter 1000 took effect. So, I, I, yeah, I think the phrase zero is an easy number to remember. So, yeah, there, there haven't been any. Um, the, uh, in terms of the entities themselves, there's a lot of good people, good tools, good study processes. What I don't see happening is the framework for actually engaging in meaningful cost discussion and benefit discussions and actually landing on a decision jointly to move forward with certain projects. And that's, that's a tough nut to crack. That's a very challenging issue. But uh, the existing entities are fully capable of doing the work that we need to do. Reorganizing, I think, if it doesn't address how are you actually going to get some consensus and participation on these bigger projects, you could reorganize over and over and it's not going to accomplish anything. It'll just feel like we're making progress. But uh, for me, the focus is on the decision making. And that's where we are starting different conversations outside the state, trying to find ourselves what the right path through is. We don't want to be participating on suboptimal projects ourselves. Uh, by the same token, though, if, California would prefer not to have to pay for the entire network upgrade if it's providing joint benefits to other parties as well. So we need a better framework for that. And I think you know some of the other discussions going on through the markets have opened up discussions at more meaningful levels than I think have occurred in the West maybe ever. So that's, that's really encouraging. Uh, I hadn't heard the word calophobia for a while, but I did hear it this morning. But uh, that's where we see needing to put the focus is how do we... We, we have studies all over. The question is how do we then get meaningful discussion about cost allocation, joint participation, and getting on with it. And we do need to get on with it. Uh, these decisions, many of these, if they're not made this year, we need to make some decisions next year and the year after. Um, you know, the 20-year the outlook, and I should just mention, the reason it's called an outlook, projects in our plan that are identified as needed once our board approved that, someone is obliged to actually go try to get it built, to try to get permit, whether it's awarded to an incumbent or uh, goes through a competitive process. So we really saw the need for that informational framework that was outside of that formal approval process. Uh, the requirement itself may become part of our tariff in the future, but we really needed to avoid the premise that just because we put something in an outlook, we were obligating someone to go try to get it built. That's an important distinction for us. Good. Uh, 
Scott, you have a pretty uniquely broad footprint for Pacific Corp, but your thoughts on institutions and looking at the West as a whole region? Yeah, I mean, I, th I, th I think Neil described it pretty well, which is, you know, everybody wants to go to heaven, nobody wants to die when it comes to cost allocation. I mean, I think everybody in this room could probably agree to a very high level that we need more transmission and that more transmission is almost an inherent good. But, you know, when the bill comes at the end of dinner, you know, everybody's kind of passing it around. Um, and, and, and I don't know, I don't know if we have you know, a, a, a silver bullet solution. Uh, what I would say is where we've found success with our transmission development has been where we have made that case to the jurisdictions that we serve that there will be a net benefit to building that transmission. And if coordinated, if planned right, it should provide those additional benefits beyond just, you know, reliability, you know, meeting load growth, you know, those other, other features I talked about earlier. And again, that's where the market's discussion is so exciting because it does introduce an opportunity, frankly, to monetize that transmission for those customers who are supporting that investment and really get paid back based on that increased market activity, that ability to transact and use transmission much more efficiently, much more dynamically than what we have traditionally done. And so that, 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 that's a piece, it, it gets down that road. It, it's not a cost allocation solution, but it is a, 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 a way to manage your costs um, by seizing market opportunities, by seizing the ability to kind of use the best, you know, resources available, not just to you, but to your neighbors as well in, in a much more optimized fashion. That gets us along the way. But until there is a more, yeah, you know, I'll just say it, until there's a more centralized or rational cost allocation paradigm across the West, we're still going to struggle with these issues. I think we plan a lot. I, th I think we, we plan, we talk to, you know, among the three planning regions, Neil hits the point right on the head, is that doesn't necessarily lead to decisions. I don't believe that the West is under planning its transmission. It, it's under building its transmission. It goes back to how decisions are made and how the, the costs and the effects of those decisions get borne. Thanks, Scott. Well, um, you know, I spend a fair amount of time in the, the, the Midwest. They've done multi-value projects for MISO and now a recent long-range transmission plan. And we heard this morning from uh, uh, Commissioner Rendell about uh, the importance of governance and participation in the process. Maury, I'm going to go to you on kind of state involvement uh, on this. Uh, I know you have thoughts about that. But, you know, the thing that seems to work in the regions, and these are diverse regions. I mean, you know, Illinois and Iowa don't, you know, culturally, politically, they're not, they're not the same by any stretch, but they, they get along on planning and cost allocation because they have the independent experts doing the planning, and then they have this uh, organization of MISO states. More, I know you know about that, but what, what do you think is that role of the, the states getting engaged to you know, build up the trust and consensus that uh, you know, to make sure people know if they're paying this ton of money that it's the right investment? Yeah, I think the you know I think the key to uh, achieving consensus and state agreement on cost allocation is at least in the in the MISO success story. I think it's the organization of MISO states. They've got a an organization that brings together the utility regulators from each of their states. They meet regularly. They have a professional staff that helps them understand the. The transmission plans help, helps them understand the cost implications, the cost trade-offs. They get together and regularly meet. I don't think you can uh, underestimate the importance of repeated gameplay in getting to a consensus outcome. If, the, if you're just getting together to, uh, you know, on a one-off basis, on an ad hoc basis, as Commissioner Tani said this morning, uh, it's going to be really difficult to achieve consensus. You, you've got to build, you know, as she said, the the muscle memory or, you know, as I would say, repeated gameplay to allow the states to build trust, understand the issues, understand the trade-offs, and then I think they can achieve, um, 
you know, consensus on these, these more difficult issues like cost allocation. Uh, you know, in the West, you heard uh, this morning that we're moving in that direction. We've got a body of state regulators that is meeting regularly and, and grappling with issues. Um, we've got a, right now, we've got a group of regulators and a group of state energy office officials that are working to, to come up with a, a regional states committee that can, that can tackle things more, bigger issues than just the EIM, right? And so they're looking at using the Committee on Regional Electric Power Cooperation, which brings together the energy office officials and the state regulators to, to engage with market developers, maybe engage with the regional planning entities uh, to you know, work on transmission planning, work on do we've got, are we identifying the right lines uh, and then maybe eventually work on cost allocation. They're, they're working to get some funding to stand that committee up and uh, start doing some more work. So I think, that's all, I think that's all promising. But I think one key to success is uh, having the states involved early and having them involved sort of continuously on a, on a regular basis. All right, thanks. We're going to switch gears a little bit. We've got a little over 10 minutes left. Um, hard problems. Uh, we like to solve hard problems with technology and innovation in this country. Uh, what, what, uh, you know, what can we uh, look for? What are the roles of grid-enhancing technologies? Uh, the HVDC technology is you know, far advanced from where it used to be. Advanced conductors, superconductors, other things are kind of coming down the pike. We're not going to get that many new rights of way. And yet, you know, the decarbonization studies say we need to double or triple the national transmission delivery capacity. There's, you know, there's th we got to be able to figure out more ways to squeeze power out of the existing rights of way and, and system. How are we going to do that? Any thoughts? Uh, at the ISO, I'd say that uh, we're always interested for any new tools we can add to the toolbox. We've used phase shifting transformers. This year's transmission plan approved two new HVDC projects that are relatively short lengths of line, but where we specifically needed the flow control from the voltage source controller HVDC technology. We are expecting to see multi-terminal voltage source technologies as well. The HVDC Classic, the, the kind that's been around for many years, that's still the highest volume transmission. So, you know, when, when we're looking at some of those lines on our outlook, we expect to see just a growing role for HVDC technologies and other flow control technologies. Uh, but the flow control helps you balance but where you already have capacity, but the flows are being governed by physics and you're not fully utilizing the capacity. We also see needing a lot of new capacity that's going to require all of these technologies as well. I know Edison's involved in a major uh, rebuild project using high temperature, low sag conductor to address clearance issues that are also providing a significant increase in capacity as a side benefit, but the original requirement was because of the, the tension sag characteristics they needed. Uh, so we're capitalizing on that, adding some extra terminal equipment and beefing up and taking advantage of the additional capacity as well. So we see all these tools as tools in the toolbox. I think the, our, our utilities have been extremely open-minded about exploring themselves and adopting any ideas that come from us or elsewhere. So that's been a huge asset to us. But there's no question as well, the I and independent system operator, that we're not directly financially involved in those decisions, gives us a huge advantage in defending the decisions to our stakeholders and also explaining where the technologies do work and at times where they don't. And we still need to just go out and build something new. Maury, technology? Well, I don't know if I have a technology recommendation. I, I, I couldn't agree more that we need to get the most out of the existing transmission system, primarily because it takes a long time to build new transmission. And so in the interim, we better be squeezing every last drop we can out of the existing system. I've, I've, all, I've been a big fan of dynamic line ratings. Uh, our reliability organization, YRAB, is, is uh, visited with the folks at FERC and recommended the implementation of dynamic line ratings to try and get the most out of the existing system. I would, I would add to that that we, we ought to be um, getting the most out of the existing right-of-ways, right? That when it comes to building new lines, uh, you know, focused first on the existing right-of-ways. You, you've probably heard I was, I was uh, speaking with some of our friends from Idaho earlier today. We've got huge federal land issues in the West. And you know, permitting on federal lands is uh, 
uh, you know, just a recipe for a very long process that, you know, ends up in probably, you know, delay after delay. Uh, you're, I think you're, even if it's more costly, I think you're better off focusing on existing right of ways and, and, and not taking on that risk. So those are the two things I would say. Focus, you know, get the most out of the existing system and get the most out of the existing right of ways. Yeah, I would just tag on to that as well. It really is about squeezing as much efficiency out of what you have today, even as you plan for that next tranche of transmission that you know you need. Um, Maury raises a really great point, which is even, even upgrading existing transmission can be a pretty arduous permitting process. And so, you know, again, looking at the scale of what we're trying to do here, you know, nationally and across the West, you know, we're talking about just the, you know, thousands of new megawatts of generation, which, which are also coming on while we're taking quite a bit of generation off as well. And so how do we get better value out of existing right away? How do we, you know, repurpose, put back in service that transmission that maybe went to a coal plant to a new technology and doing so in a way that doesn't create disincentives? Uh, to doing so, I think is really important. Uh, on the technology side, I think storage. Uh, you know, I, I, I don't know if we have fully learned yet what storage can do as far as enhancing um, existing transmission, whether you're using, using storage as a generation technology or as a transmission technology or providing ancillary services. We're pretty excited at Pacific Corp. We're really on the cusp of integrating storage into our system in the, the first real big way here in the next couple of years. So I think that's a technology that is maybe underappreciated today as far as what it can do for enhancing transmission. I did, right. want, I did want to jump in on the uh, corridor use because I totally agree with that up to a point. And that point is our risk of losing entire corridors. You know, for a lot of people, it seemed to come as a surprise that smoke, the soot and smoke is a wonderful conductor. So flashovers from wildfire risk, it takes out the whole corridor. You're not talking one line at a time. A bit of route diversity doesn't help you there. So with our wildfire risk being what it is, we have to pay a lot of attention to how much power we put in individual corridors or how much we're relying on specific corridors because they're more vulnerable. And that's just the consequence of climate change that we're at more wildfire risk than we've been before. And we have to adapt to that. So there are limits on, you know, by all means, take advantage of the corridors you have up to the point, but it's a real risk in many of our areas about losing those entire corridors. Thanks, Neil. Uh, before Joanne gives us the hook here, uh, since this is Kaiso's show, Neil, I'll give you the last question. It's about um, public policy. If we, if we could uh, pull that slide up, actually, again. So you okay. have certain resources on the other side of transmission, but of course, transmission mm -hmm. in this country is open access under the Federal Power Act. So uh, Kaiso has put out a couple iterations of ideas, yes. and uh, there is this New Jersey example where New Jersey said, well, we want to do transmission for offshore wind. We're willing to pay for it. Um, but then they went to FERC and said, yeah, but if we pay for it and then Maryland uses all that capacity, what, like, that, that's not going to work. We're not going to pay for it. Give us some assurance that we can use mm -hmm. the lines for their intended purpose. And FERC did that, and obviously, and with a uh, you know, yeah. bipartisan vote at FERC. So, yeah, so for what us, are you going to? For us, we had a slightly different issue, which was uh, it is open access. And the other thing that's been happening for us is the sol especially storage projects, but solar and storage can get developed and apply and get into our interconnection queue very quickly. Now, some of the transmission we're looking at planning is for really long lead time resources, whether it's for the geothermal coming out of Imperial Valley, uh, potentially some pump storage projects, as well as some of the uh, potential for offshore wind. So the concern is if we move on these transmission projects, but all that capacity just gets immediately opened into our interconnection process and uh, storage and solar projects line up there because that capacity is becoming available, we will never achieve those longer term policy objectives that the transmission was built for. So we have proposed some modifications to our tariff to actually, in very specific cases, 
holding back some of that transmission capacity for the policy purpose that it's being developed for. And we wanna be clear, we do not wanna be the ones making the decision that that's the policy purpose. That would have to come through the appropriate uh, the state authority, whether it was executive order or commission decision. But uh, we do see the need to hold that capacity back because of our overheated queue. Like, after cluster 14, we had peaked at having 245,000 megawatts in our interconnection queue, uh, 150 of storage and 100,000 megawatts of renewable generation. Um, you know, cluster 14 alone added 100 and over 150,000 megawatts of, into our queue. So we have to be able to manage that situation where we have such a large volume of projects showing up and uh, also make sure that we're able to advance the state policy goals, not for an individual developer, but for that resource type in the right location. And just as a final comment on that, I think that's just one step in a bigger structure where our transmission planning process, I would say, is largely working, providing we have the right conversations and the right inputs. And we're really proud of things like the Outlook. On the interconnection side, the pace of development is going to require us to, something we said right in our 20 in our strategic plan is we really do need to reimagine the connections between our interconnection process the long-term planning process and the uh, procurement activities by the load serving entities all of our current processes were designed around a certain cadence that may have been able to handle moving a couple of thousand megawatts through a year but to accelerate that to 7,000, which is what we expect in next year's plan, those processes just won't be able to handle that tempo of development. And we're going to have to tighten those linkages and find a better way to move forward more efficiently. All right, well, that's, uh, that's great. And uh, I, I don't know, you might need a little work on your lunch buffet queue. I'm not sure you built confidence. I saw some queue jumpers. Uh, I didn't dare jump the queue, uh, just to be uh, clear. I have uh, witnesses. Uh, uh, I didn't take pictures. Don't worry. You're off the hook. Uh, well, look, I think you kept everybody <laughs> awake at least after this panel, so help me thank this great, uh, this great panel. Thank you.